Welcome to episode 64 of the Clive Barker podcast. Uh, so this was a fun episode. Jose and I talked about Hyperkind. Uh, Hyperkind being part of the um, Clive Barker's universe, the Decamundi uh, Marvel Razor line. Uh, Marvel gave Clive Barker his whole universe to basically create uh, whatever he wanted, and there were four comic series in this, uh, and Hyperkind is the first one that we're talking about. They're kind of Clive Barker's X-Men, I guess you could say. All right, so yeah, episode 64, Hyperkind. start with the news so yeah it, it, this uh this month february this upcoming month um the the fangoria magazine number 330 came out with an with a, a, a long article that's almost uh almost over 10 pages long and it's got david cronenberg on nightbreed so it opens up with this uh wonderful uh i think it's it's three or four i think it's four pages of cronenberg interview and uh, it's chock full of pictures. It's awesome. It's got pictures of Cronenberg uh, uh, as Decker. It, it has him talking about what kind of direction Clive gave him, uh, how much he worked for the role, and uh, you know how how he uh, inhabited the role of Decker and all that stuff. So that, it, it's really cool. And I, I don't think he ever spoke about his uh, acting uh, uh, role before to this extent. So, yeah. uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's more than four pages. It's like five, five pages long. So, and then after that, there's like, um, there's an, uh, uh, interview with, uh, Doug Bradley. Uh, the second part of this article is called the eyes of Lylesburg. So you got, you got Doug Bradley talking about the fan dub, talking about, uh, his recollections of, uh, of the shoot and, uh, yeah, that's it's really interesting. Um they also interviewed Ann Bobby. Um the third part of the article it's called Anne of a Thousand Monsters. Uh really cool where she talks about disposophobia and you know, her you know, the the, the scenes where she saves uh Babette and yeah. uh, how how disappointing was it to see the original version of Nightbreed cut so drastically and and then she said that she only saw it once before and and she she was very disappointed, more confused and disappointed. So, yeah, it's um, I, you know, and, and I, I keep forgetting that she was also a voice actor in Bioshock. <laughs> right. So they also talk about yeah. that. And, oh, uh, cool. Yeah, I guess I didn't get to that part. I think I just read the. So far, I just read David Cronenberg and Doug Bradley. And then there is another part uh, written by John Nichol where he interviewed Clive Barker and Mark Miller, and they explain what happened to this cut <laughs> they have a funny picture of, of Narcisse and he's tearing out his scalp and then it says a lack of a proper Nightbreed release for two decades had Clyde Barker buffs tearing their hair out so uh, <laughs> kind of kind of yeah yeah they're talking about the footage the restoration if it's possible you know what what is possible for the fans to see and of course we know now that it's going to be just sourced from the VHS tapes Asking for Mark Miller what kind of hurdles he had to overcome to be able to start looking for this. He did start uh, the whole search for the Nightbreed footage, even though he didn't really go anywhere, and they were found almost by mistake. But he, to his credit, he was the guy who decided to start you know, asking questions and calling people. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that Clyde Barker had this in the uh, Seraphin office. <laughs> yeah. So I can't even imagine how much stuff is, is in those three houses that Clive owns. Yeah, well, it was three back then. Yeah, so funny thing is they used the poster of the Cabal Cut that I composed using Les Edwards' art in this article. They have that thing there. It's page 51. Page 51, there's my fan-made one sheet for the Cabal yeah. Cut. Yeah, and, um And then on page 52, there is the banner that, you know, we came up with for Occupy Midian. 
which is nice to see in the magazine. It's it's wonderful. Yep. Then they also interview um, Russell sending Carrington. You, sending you a check for that, right? <laughs> they keep, right, yeah. <laughs> that, they talk with uh, Russell Charrington as well in a page that's called Occupy Midian. And yeah. then it, it says, The trail leading to Night Free the Cabal Cut was blazed by a truly determined fan who helped ignite a movement that would demonstrate that passion could shape the outcome of art. At first, I thought they were talking about you. No, Russell Charrington was the man behind the drive to restore Clive Barker's monster epic to its intended vision. Here he speaks on the resulting phenomenon. And then, instead of talking about Occupy Midian, they talk about how he came up with the Cabal Cut. Yeah. The version, this version's festival life, and... Uh, yeah, so that's that's cool. There's like the one sheet for the Nightbreed Cabal Cut. There's the banner for the movement. That's interesting. So that was cool. I, it was nice uh, to finally get to see uh, an article about it on Fangoria. We had one in Rue Morgue before. But this one yeah. is really, really cool because it's got Cronenberg talking about it. Yeah, right, right. He did. Um, he hasn't been involved really in, in Occupy Midian or talked about um, talked about Nightbreed much. No, uh, no, he hasn't. Yeah. And uh, there was another discovery they did, right, for the release? Uh, yeah, so there's a box of Nightbreed production stills, which you had pointed out were they were brought up before on the official Nightbreed page by uh, Morgan Creek. But uh, it's this is news because now uh, Shout Factory has that box of, of production stills to use, uh, presumably in a slideshow uh, in, in the special features for the for the release. That's cool. I mean, I don't know if they are the same that I pointed out because that's a really big box and it's got a bunch of slides in there. They're the old kind of slides, so they're not the proofs that we saw being posted on Nightbreed, mm-hmm. but I'm sure there must be a lot of those things in there. I'm sure there's some good stuff in there. I bet there are things of monsters that we, you know, that you don't get to see very well in the movie. Right, like in Nightbreed Chronicles where you get to see yeah. the- people like a frick Mm -hmm. which is supposed to be a a wordplay on freak it's funny because in those early pictures that were posted in the nightbreed official page he has a different name Mm. so um you know some of some of those monsters have different names in those pictures well in nightbreed chronicles was kind of made up by clive barker after the movie was already done right right yeah he came up with all those uh backstories and stories even for like witches that just show up for like a second in the movie. <laughs> yeah. They made, a, made up this story that, oh, she used to live in a cave and make prophecies out of statues she sculpted out of butt guano. Yeah. That's out there. So, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Okay. So, Freak used to be called. Freak was called Bartholomew, which is really, you know, because oh. that's a more normal name. Yeah. Uh, so, Freak, the guy with the stretched down face uh, that looks mm-hmm. like a horse, he was named Bartholomew. In these pictures. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's wonderful. I'm sure that whatever material that they can dig up now is probably going to make its way at some point to the Shout Factory. I'd love to see, like, other trailers, TV spots. They always do a good job with their releases, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be cool. I haven't actually seen a release by Shout Factory yet. I don't own any. I've never watched one. I'll be looking forward to that. Oh, yeah. Next, of course, uh, this is news that actually you and I kind of knew something about for a long time and were not allowed to talk about. Jacqueline S. Her Will and Testament is being adapted into a movie. Yes, that's true. Uh, the announcement came out just uh, yesterday, I think. And uh, Toronto-based Raven Banner Entertainment has optioned Clyde Barker's Books of Blood short story, Jacqueline S. Her Will and Testament, for screen treatment, according to Fangoria.com and Screen Daily. They talked to Mark Miller, who confirmed this. He said that we love what Raven Banner is doing for horror. We are excited to be collaborating with them. And production on the Jacqueline Hass movie is scheduled to begin this fall. Partners Michael Past, James Fleur, and Andrew Hunt of uh, Raven Banner brokered the deal with Noor Ahmed of Redder and Feig on behalf of Seraphin. I wonder if that's like a lawyer firm or something. Mm. So, yeah, more of this as it develops, we have an idea who the director is going to be, but we can't say anything. Yeah, so awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great story. It's a very strong mm-hmm. story from the Books of Blood. Uh, yeah. uh, it's just a, a gold mine for movie adaptations, the Books of Blood. I mean, there's stuff like Pig Blood Blues. The story that I would love to see an adaptation most of all would be Sex, Death, and Starshine. I think that would be an amazing film. The one with the tumor? 
the one with the uh, theater actors. Oh yes, yeah, right. Yeah. And ghosts, yeah, that, right. that one. That one's amazing for me. I, I think that's one of the my favorite books of blood stories. Yeah, that's that's Jacqueline S. So uh, yeah. let's let's see how that develops. And and for people that can't remember which story that is, it's Jacqueline S. Is the one who could uh, move things with her mind. So she would basically she used the power to to crush men. I think her powers were more like she could control flesh, uh, the shape mm-hmm. of flesh. She can mold flesh with her mind. Yeah, I think that's probably right. I doubt. I it, now that you say that, it seems like she probably never. I don't think she used it on anything else. Right, like on any inanimate objects or anything. But yeah. So it's yeah. very, very, very sensual, very, uh, very visceral movie, very mm-hmm. visceral story. So, yeah, interesting, uh, exciting. I think that people have been trying to push this movie into production for some time, and I think that it was uh, shopped around in the Berlin film market. Now it's got a production team, so you know, let's see what happens. Yeah. So next thing, uh, the Labyrinth, uh, they just put up some behind-the-scenes photos from Hellraiser 2 by Stuart Conran, which is pretty cool. So I'd go check that out. It's labyrinth-website.com slash Stuart Photos. Um, and then and then on the website, we, we have some news stories up, and, uh, and Andrew Kopp uh, just did a review of Nightbreed number 10. So, so he's kind of working his way through the Nightbreed and Hellraiser comics of the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. Just to kind of a reminder, if you if you check out our website, we're uh, we're doing a pretty good job now keeping up with the news. Uh, early, you know, early on when we started this, we were mainly just posting our podcasts, but uh, but now we're we're doing more news stuff. And you know, you want to go to Revelations for the official news, uh, obviously. But you know, we have that too. But uh, but we also cover unofficial news, so yeah. stuff that's not directly from Clive Barker. We will cover that you know that's peripheral or tangential. We have mastered our system to the point where we can actually get on the news as it happens. And and being part of Occupy Midian, you know, has kind of put us on a little bit of a, an inner circle as far as hearing, you know, hearing about some things that are going on. Absolutely. So we are starting uh, in this episode, we are starting a series about the Marvel Razorline comic books, which beget the Barkerverse. Yeah. And it seems like this will be kind of educational for people because... Uh, two times we've asked if anyone had any questions or feedback and nobody had anything, which is not, which is unusual. And it makes me think that a majority of Clive Barker fans haven't read these. They came out in 93. They're 20 years old. Yeah. I guess for a lot of people out there. And they had a short run. It was less than a year. Yeah. It was just pretty much an autumn, you know, part of a summer and part of the autumn of 93. And then yeah. there was a uh, there was a brief resurgence in in the following year in August of uh, ninety four. Yeah. So they came out August ninety three and then August ninety four. There was a, an extra issue for all of these. So you're right. It's something that probably was a blip in the radar for a lot of fans that were into Clyde Barker at the time. Yeah. But for those who were younger, maybe or you know uh, mm-hmm. didn't didn't read comics, it probably just passed them by. Yeah. Um, and I, as I read all of these comics, I read the letters mainly because I was curious to see if any of the people who wrote the letters are people that we know. Uh, and now that we're so much into the Clive Barker fan circle, you know. Good point. Uh, but I didn't recognize any of the names. I did find myself looking at the names of the letters, too. Uh, actually, I was wondering if our friend David was one of those, but no. <laughs> yeah. No such yeah. He, he does like to write to people. Yeah. The first thing that came out was a 75 cent special comic book called the Special Preview Issue of Razor Line <clears throat> Superheroes from the Mind of Clive Barker, and it was called First Cut. Yeah. So this was a short promotional issue. There was an introduction from Clive Barker where he explained his idea about the comic book as a medium, where he said that where else can a creator make mischief on a cosmic scale? Tell tales in which worlds rise and fall in the space of a few panels, where battles may shake the stars and every emotion, grief, joy, rage, hope, is felt and expressed on a mythic scale. And he's talking about comics. Yeah, and he talks about the Decamundi, which is kind of the ten worlds that, that were sort of set aside for him outside of the Marvel Universe. We're going to talk about Hyperkind, yeah. They all came out pretty much at the same time, but I think first it was Ecto Kid and yeah. Hyperkind, and then I think it was 
uh, uh, Saint Sinner and Hokum and X. One thing that we'll notice as we go along here too is that uh, Hy- Hokum and Hex and Hyperkind they cross over each other. It came out in, in late August of '93, but it was a September issue. Yeah. Hyperkind is the most 90s of these comic books in terms of superheroes because the Hyperkind comic book is Clyde Barker does superheroes, you know, Marvel yeah. superheroes. Like, you know, and he's talked in a lot of interviews about how much he loved the X Men and he was more of a Marvel person than a, than a DC person. In this first cut comic book, Clyde Barker opened up with his uh, prologue. And an uh, interesting uh, factor here is that Malcolm Smith was the consulting editor for Razor Line. And uh, he was oh. consulting editor for a lot of these comic books. For all of them, in fact, I think, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken. So Malcolm Smith was Ashbury in Nightbreed at the time. Yeah. And he was also Clyde Barker's lover. Yeah. Okay, so Hyperkind, it says here the, the new heroes, the Hyperkind, are four young people who have taken on the mantle of a much older band of champions called Paxis. It's interesting. One of these characters, I don't know if you were a big uh, Avengers fan at the time, but you remember Vision, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I know yeah. what you're talking about. It reminds me a lot of this guy Logix from the Hyperkind. Yeah. Because especially, yeah. especially since this was the time when the Vision became a white character instead of oh, being... Oh, yeah. Instead of being the uh, orange-faced, uh, yellow and mm-hmm. green. So it's interesting because this introduces an alternate light- timeline where World War I and World War II um, were not just about the Axis and the Allied forces. They Maybe were just World War I, right? I don't think that they talked about World War II. They talk about World War II in one of these comic books. They, they do mention World War II as well. I think that that may have been some confusion from the part of the writers, because this this uh, this particular title is all over the place. Well, and Clive Barker seems like he's obsessed with World War One because it comes up a lot in backstories of things. Yeah, yeah, and so um, I think, and I think that 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 the the alternate history of World War One is probably the most interesting thing about Hyperkind. Yeah. So in this case, it seems to me more like it was not a, a war between humans. The World War that they mentioned, mm-hmm. but it was a war of the humans against the uh, Horusians and the uh, what was the other name? Anubisians or something like that. They're basically like Anubis e or something yeah. like that. Yeah. This guy called Thermak came to Earth and he said, "I'm here to help you end this war with the uh, Horusians and the Anubisti, and I need five humans to provide to give powers to so they can protect Earth." Mm-hmm. And then after the um, – and they became the Paxes. And after this, uh, they defeated these aliens. Uh, he was supposed to take back the powers and, uh, and you know, go to another world where the uh, this war would continue and he would find another five saviors there. But something went wrong. The Paxes lost their way and they got defeated by this guy called John Paragon. Yeah, and he uh, he wanted to be a Paxis uh, in the beginning, and then when that didn't happen, he became very resentful of the Paxis and of Thermak, and he started to accuse Thermak of having his own agenda. Well, he he, he thought that Thermak wanted to take over the whole world. Yeah, so he decided to defeat the Paxis and take their powers. But what happened was that the Paxis just they just lost their powers and they fell into forgetfulness and also John Paragon had this drug created called Zona which mm-hmm. would remove the memories of the Paxis on a global scale which to me it's it's the most silly thing I've ever heard in this comic book. Yeah. It's like you can't just make people forget the Paxis especially if they help beat the And that was combined with like worldwide broadcasts of alternate history. Yeah, but it's just, I I don't know. I thought Fred Burke, he was not a very good writer. We were joking about it the other day. You were telling me, oh, yeah. man, this, this comic book had terrible writing up to a point. Then it got a little better, and then, you know. Yeah. And it's true. I mean, they got, this story is all over the place. They got four teenagers. Yeah. There's a, a love triangle between uh, Kenny, Lisa, and the other girl. Uh, Deanne. And uh, and there's another guy called George. Right. One of those girls, she's a, a senior in high school, and she's also a stripper and a crack whore. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that you know, and she works for a madame, Madame Wo, and, yeah. and a guy called Zandor or whatever. So that that's really that's really weird. 
George is a skater who's also a drug dealer and lives in the streets. Yeah, he's like a he's like a street punk. Yeah. Gang. Sort of almost sort of gang member, but not exactly. And Kenny is a jock with a weird, with one of those you know '90s haircuts who just traded Lisa, who's like this rich girl who creates drama over everything. She decides that her life isn't worth living because she got dumped by Kenny over Diane. Mm-hmm. She runs away crying. We we open up with the I forget cut. now. Are, are we still in first cut, or did we move on to number one? I think we moved on to number one. Yeah, because first cut really only describes when they get their powers and they fight Thermac. But then number one goes back and says, okay, well, this is how it started. Yeah, yeah. And first cut, the only thing we get is the first pages of the first issue. Yeah. And they're slightly different. Like, just, just a tiny bit different. You don't really get to see Thermac, like, going, ah, oh, look at, you know, and he changes and gets all big and powerful. Oh, yeah, sure. I see what you mean. Lisa Lisa is in combat with Thermac, and there's this guy who lives in the street as well. Mm-hmm. His name is... Eschebacher. Yeah, I was trying to want, figure out how to pronounce it. He's like a, basically a clone of Captain America. Yeah, that's pretty much what he is, except now here he's like a looks like a bum. He's got a beard, he's all disheveled. Lisa is having this argument with her boyfriend, Kenny. She runs away, crying. Uh, Kenny, Diane, and George go after her. She uh, runs into an alley where Eskabacher falls from the sky uh, mm-hmm. in front of Lisa. And then she uh, she tries to understand what's happening here. And then this guy ha- appears called the Dutchman. And this guy, is a, he's a typical Clyde Barker drawing. He's a guy that's short, stubby. He's got a white, long beard. He's got a yeah. jacket, a scarf. And he, he looks like one of those drawings Clive does all the time. Like a big guy yeah. with a beard and, you know, long mm-hmm. hair. But it turns out that he's not a human. He's actually a, a giant lizard alien called uh, Thermac. Yeah, that we talked about earlier. Who's just wearing that human skin to look like a person. But Yeah, and Eskbacher used to be a super soldier, the leader of the Paxis. The early incarnation of the Paxis was Logica, uh, Clarion, the right eye of God, uh, Eskbacher, Tempest, the furious werewoman, and Dream Dance, the mistress of illusion. But anyway, uh, Eskbacher remembers that he was Eskbacher because apparently his memory had been, you know, affected by the, the Nova from uh, on John. And he remembers who he is. Just at the time when uh, Thermac decides that, oh, you're, you know, Eskbacher, so I, I'm going to kill you because I want your powers. I need the powers to take back to the Kuo, uh, which is this, uh, I think it's a race of aliens. And they're the ones who control the, the powers of the Paxis. So he wants the powers back, but Eskbacher has different plans. He decides to escape, even though he's hit bad, and he tells the the four kids that you guys need to take this and go to go to this secret location, and uh, you're the only ones who can stop Thermac and uh, just get on the sarcophagi, and you'll be given powers to defeat this alien. And so Lisa opens up this facility where she finds five sarcophagi, Mm-hmm. And she puts herself in one of those, and she gets powers. She gets transformed. Meanwhile, the other guys are like, oh, no, we can't let Lisa get in there. That thing is going to, you know, we don't know what yeah. that machine's going to do. And then Thermac is fighting Esbacher, and he ends up crashing into the place, and uh, just as Lisa uh, emerges with her powers. And while yeah. she's fighting him, the other guys decide that, well, maybe we should get into the sarcophagi as well, because that's the only place we're going to be safe. Which it's silly. <laughs> oh, there's yeah, there's his dog. So when when es- Eschebacher falls out of the sky, there's a dog there that says Arf. <laughs> He's gonna and be the, very yeah. important later on. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't I, I didn't even remember that there was a dog until until that came up later in the series. That's one of those silly things that happens in the story. So Thermac, the lawgiver of Kuo, exposes his true form, and he ends up being defeated by them. And he has to retreat and, uh, you know, heal himself. Then that's when Paragon John starts showing up in the stories. And Paragon John is this character, like we said, who wanted to be a Paxis. And he actually uh, worked with the Paxis for a while. But then Thermax said, this guy is very unstable. You know, this guy is not yeah. fit to be a Paxis. And uh, he got really resentful about it. So, Did he kick you out? Is that why you hate him so much? <laughs> 
And then he goes like, I don't want to be one of them. I want to destroy them. <laughs> yeah. So he decides that he gives a little push here and there during the Paxis combats with other enemies. And he uh, makes sure that they all eventually lose their powers or die. Or in the case of Logica, he gives his own power away. We kind of moved on into an other issues now, right? Yeah. I'm trying I'm trying to follow along based on, you know, each issue. So in the first issue I had some I mean I, I I've taken notes based on each one. So it's I'm kind of kind of getting lost when you're going on into like I don't I think you're in like number three or something now. I'm gonna let you go on with the notes and I'll just jump in whenever I have something important. In number one here, I guess the thing that I thought was lame uh, there was a quote, man, where's Professor X when you need him? <laughs> the, there's a bunch of stuff like that. Uh, the Hulk yeah. appears as an illusion in one of the last issues. Yeah, because George is a comic book fan, and he, he sells drugs so that he can buy comic books, which is a really a really good life lesson for the kids reading this. Yeah, and there's another issue where they say, uh, oh, I think he learned that trick from a guy called Stan Lee. Yeah, yeah. I I, re I do really like the cover for uh, number one. It's um, kind of metallic and it's and it's got raised. Yeah, metallic foil embossed cover. That's really nice. yeah, yeah. So that's that was a that was a cool way to get people interested in it. Yeah, the characters themselves. So now when these guys transform, uh, and this is this is now moving on into number two, they give themselves names, and this was th this just really made me cringe. But they're they're like name they're naming themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he says like I have the cold, I have cold logic, so I'll be called logic. And and uh, Kenny jumps in. And he's like, No, <laughs> man, that's not how it works. He says it's logics with an X. Yeah. And he says, and I'm a muck with two Ks, and let me run with it. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is the worst, right? <laughs> this is stupid, but it's like George was written to be like a stereotypical black character, but then they just made him white. Yeah. Just by the way he talks, and and it's like he's talking this urban, you know, slang. I don't know. I I just thought that they went a little overboard with that. Yeah. Well, and and comic books, I guess, in the '90s were kind of like that, where people would say stupid things. Yeah. I remember one time a friend of mine showed me an X Men, where somebody was falling. At, I think it was Beast or somebody was falling out of an airplane, and he said this huge long paragraph while he was falling. And then, uh, and then he landed on a house and fell into the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And the noise that it made when he landed in the bathroom said, like, bathroom. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. They're guilty of doing that in Hyperkind as well. There's a yeah. bunch of, like, splash pages where they're just, like, bursting through a door. And still they go on and they have these huge balloons of dialogue where <laughs> yeah. it takes, like, two minutes to read all that stuff. But they're just in this dynamic pose where they're just slamming through a door. But then it's like... Yeah, and, and bullets are, like, flying or past their head. <laughs> yeah. It's typical of the 90s. Yeah. And oh, and there was another thing in number two. Um, some, you know, when when, uh, when people see the hyperkind for the first time, this, this kid goes, they're from another planet. Do they want to talk to Ross Perot? Oh, I was like, oh, God. It's like, could you date this anymore? It's it's weak. It's, it's weak. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and and not. I mean, it's 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 making jokes at the expense of the story because it takes away a lot of the believability when you're you know when you're downplaying the the seriousness of what's going on. There's a little panel on number two where there's two kids talking and says, "Wow, this is like something out of my buddy's comics collection. Check it out." And the <laughs> other guy says, "Come on, Carlos. It's just another movie stunt." Oh, I know it's, yeah. it's funny. They 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 put those little tongue in cheek moments in there, and and uh, at the end, what happens in number two is that because people were uh, saw them fight against Thermac, Bliss, which is the name of the um, the character that Diane transforms into, mm -hmm. she turns into uh, she makes this illusion where she turns herself into like a production assistant, and says, "Cut, that's a wrap, guys. Great work." Um, and then she yeah. turns to the public and says, "You extras are perfect." Look for yourselves in crock baddies from the stars this Christmas. Oh, yeah. One thing I really I really liked is the ads. There's a lot of ads for uh, for old Sega Genesis games and stuff in here. Mm -hmm. There's another another panel that's funny where uh, Amok says, "How oh, am I ever going to play guitar with these?" Because Amok and this is you know I don't yeah. know people out there in case you never read it, Amok 
doesn't have hands. He has two giant blades coming out of his forearms. Yeah, he's he's basically a Wolverine type. Kind of like that, yeah. This huge beast-like red guy who seems to be made out of metal just like any, any other superhero was in the 90s. Yeah. He's got huge muscles and then, like, lines across him like Colossus. Yeah. And what's what's the name of the Lisa character? She's uh, Armada. Ar- Armada with a T. With a T. Instead of yeah. Armada with a D, she's Armata. <laughs> so she has guns that are basically fused to her arms, or she creates guns out of nothing, and, and she fires uh, bullets that are basically made out of her life force. Uh, at the end of number two, there's uh, before they started having a, a, a letter section, they had um, a section where the... Uh, the people involved with the comic book would uh, announce it. So Clyde Barker has a uh, text at the end of number two where he says, I was interested in creating mythologies that were close to the things I had read as a kid. I'm talking about the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, and so on, rather more on the nose sort of stuff. So I went to Marvel and said, look, I really am eager to do this, but I feel as though I need to carve off a little section of comic book reality to call mine. Because otherwise I'm going to start trading on Marvel's rules and regulations, and I know they're relatively restricted. I then said, I have four titles for you, and a cycle of ten worlds, the Decamundi. These four titles will occur in these worlds, but I'll offer up the observation that at least several of those worlds will be open internally into other worlds, so the Decamundi may be just the beginning of an expanding universe. And then he goes on to say, the most on the nose of the titles is Hyperkind. I'm a great fan of team superheroes, and that goes back to my first encounter with the Fantastic Four. They caught my imagination and have continued to hold my imagination. Hyperkind postulates that in the 40s, there was an extraordinary band of superheroes called Paxis, who defended the Earth from all corners, but were eventually destroyed by the machinations of a supervillain called Paragon John. He basically made sure that Hyperkind members were either destroyed or driven to madness. The powers of the Paxes were each preserved in a kind of sarcophagus. The last act of the leader, Eschbacher, was, or Esch, Eschbacher, was to preserve these powers. What happens now is that four kids and then a surprise character, led by the dying Eschbacher, chance upon these charge-up sarcophagi and are granted the powers of superheroes from two generations earlier. So in a way, what we're doing is postulating the existence of a comic that never existed, a Golden Age comic named P- called Paxis. And Paxis are the spiritual grandchildren of a generation of superheroes that for- fought for justice and goodness in the purest sense, and fell, as it turns out, because of frailties within themselves. Paragon John is powerful, but couldn't have succeeded in Paxis' destruction if they had not been intrinsically flawed. The first to gain the powers, in her case, those of Eschbacher himself, is Lisa Moffat. And then he goes on to describe uh, Lisa, Kenny, uh, George, and Diane. And mm-hmm. then he says, I think my job here is hopefully to create some mythologies that writers and artists will, in years to come, find intriguing and bring their own things to. I want to be democratic about this. I'm the pump primer here. My attitude as much as it is with the Hellraiser sequels, that I will watch over this stuff and give support, encouragement, and ideas when requested. But my initial gift, if you like, is the gift of an idea, and I hope will be rich enough to encourage diverse hands and imaginations to play with. So yeah. that's, that's what he said. As usual, Clive is being spoilery here because this is issue number two, and he's already talking about Paragon John and how he, you know, try to destroy yeah. the Paxes, but... And at this point, I was kind of like, I was kind of dreading reading the rest of them. Um, <laughs> you know, after after having read some of the, the, the horrible dialogue in, in these. And also, the way that these characters act, I didn't care about them, or want them to succeed, because they're so stupid. I know, they're a little annoying. A little strange, like, Diane. In issue number three, she's shown... Uh, uh, being a stripper in the club when she's a senior in high school, that would mean she's probably 17. Oh, I thought she was a senior in college. No, these are high school students. They, they're referred to teenagers and high school students all the time. I've, I just don't understand how uh, Diane was uh, was a stripper. And, yeah, uh, no, that doesn't make sense. And and she also did crack. But what, once she finds the, the – once she becomes hyper kind, then she doesn't need it anymore. Here's one thing. Uh, did you understand the point of the story for mission number three, those black blobs that float around? No. Number three completely – I mean, I thought maybe it was because I was really tired because it was late at night, but I completely was lost. It was just a filler issue. It's like, wow, it, 
and, and just, they even it, there was even sort of an apology later because they go back and and give an explanation of what the black blobs are uh-huh. uh, later on. I think at the end of like number of Unleashed or number nine or something. Oh wow, yeah. I didn't even notice that part, but I did notice that I was like, wow, they just finished the uh, origin story in the first two issues, and already they're starting with filler issues, because yeah. I thought that this story was just like, they find the, Bliss sees these blobs of uh, darkness floating mm-hmm. above people, and she doesn't know what that is, and uh, she tries to investigate, and she finds that those blobs, when she hits them with her energy, they become big, and then they, they dissolve. And and at one point she starts doing that and shows it to the hyper kind and they all of a sudden the blobs start getting bigger but they start getting together and creating this huge blob that keeps getting bigger and bigger and it turns into a giant fetus which yeah. the hyper kind is fighting and shooting rays at and it just keeps feeding on them <laughs> and it turns and out it says, that, Wah. and it says Wah. and it turns out that oh uh, I think it's feeding on a rays maybe if we if we stop Shooting at it, it'll go away. And then that's what happens. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that is a completely anticlimactic story. Yeah. I mean, the, so basically that blob baby didn't do anything at all. <laughs> it's like, I don't yeah. see the point of the story, but, you know. Well, and they go back and say, uh, in, at the at the very end, they go back and say, no, you thought that you created those, but you didn't. That That was like the... That was like the leftover negative energy caused by this the Zoma drug or whatever the yeah so and uh, and you just made it so people could see it and also uh, the part where Logica jumps into his dad's computer to avoid the Paragon John's computer mm-hmm. virus to destroy all the files in his dad's computer and I'm yeah. like oh no there he goes his dad's IRS returns. Yeah, he jumps in there, and it's such a '90s vision of computer and cyberspace. Yeah, he's just floating around. He's got all these zeros and ones on top of him, and then he sees these huge floppy disks, <laughs> yeah. like the five and a quarter inch yeah. floppy disks or something. And he just he sees those things, and he's like, "Oh my god, these are the files!" It's such a you know hackers kind of thing. Yeah. And then that's when he... And at that point, five and a quarter floppy disks were already obsolete. Yeah, they were the only floppy disks that were floppy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, people weren't using those when this comic was written. It's really a filler issue, but they do introduce Paragon John. They do give a little more exposition about the characters, uh, briefly. So, yeah, Yeah. oh, yeah, and one of the superheroes actually robs a car. George keeps robbing stuff, so. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, what are you you guys trying to do? I know that they're dumb teenagers, but I don't think they're exactly superhero material, and that's actually part of the story, like them realizing they may not be superhero material. Yeah. Well, and the the sad thing is that the, the people who came before them, the Paxis, were actually decent people that were good at what they did, and they were sort of selected based on their qualifications. Yeah, and uh, and they still failed. And these people are are just miserable. They're terrible at what at their job. And they they jump in blindly into every every encounter, not knowing anything about what it is. And logics is supposed to be really smart and supposed to be able to figure out any you know the weakness of any situation and. But he doesn't do anything. I know. And they're probably the most conspicuous superheroes I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're in the middle of the street, and they go like, okay, well, we need to turn on our powers. <laughs> it's always it's always a muck saying, okay, let's power up, guys. Well, I'm not going to look for a phone booth every time I need to do something. And they just <laughs> transform in the middle of the street. <laughs> yeah. You know. But nobody, nobody really cares what – because nobody knows who they are and nobody cares what their identities are, right? apparently. I mean, you'd think yeah. that – and and, uh, and Lisa's father works for John Doerr, who is Paragon John, mm-hmm. uh, at Paragon Industries or Paragon Publishing, I think it is. They, they do newspapers and they're like this huge multi-conglomerate type yeah. of a – Basically, he's you know. a Ted Turner gone evil. Yeah. Something like that. Did you enjoy the the part where the uh, there was an issue in the series that was completely done sideways? No. Oh my God! Is that uh, which? That's number six. It seemed like something that was popular in the '90s at some point because I remember X Force 
issue yeah. being like sideways. There was a Spider-Man issue being sideways. The first couple of pages were like that, and I was reading it, and then I thought, I, and then and then I returned the pages, and it's like, oh, you're still doing this. And then I went back and looked at the cover, and like, oh god, the cover's like that too. Hyperkind Four is weird because instead of having a page where the sequential art is put on that page, they do this thing where they splash the uh, the artwork. Oh over two pages and and you have to read from left to right across two pages and yes. then go down yeah yeah that really threw me too i hated that and it seems like it's that would be extra work for them to try to lay that out and i don't know why it, and it and it's irritating for the people it was a little irritating yeah and number four has this um, these hilarious multi-page ads for this thing called adventure vision uh-huh. which is like a role-playing game that uses video vhs tapes <laughs> and then did you like the the part where Paragon John is this horribly evil character who can zap people across their video phones? Yeah, oh god. Yeah. Like he uh there's there's one point where I uh, told you not to run that story and you did it anyway. Is like you shouldn't have violated my copyright, Mr. Dwayne. And then he yeah. he presses a button, and the guy on the other side <laughs> in his office gets electrocuted somehow. Yeah. And it's like, wow, that's 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 weird. Yeah. And of course, he has a ponytail, as all yeah. villains in the '90s had. Yeah. This is when Paragon John is trying to figure out who are the uh, these new Paxes, these new hyper kind. Yeah. Is it is number four when he catches them? Yes. Yeah, at the end of number four, he, he he actually captures them really easily because they're so dumb. I mean, they fall for anything. Yeah, he has this gas. But do you remember the part where Paragon is talking to his Paragon core, and uh, and there's one guy who comes over and says, okay, we're ready. We got the weapons. We got the troops. We are going to get the Hyperkind. We're going to get them. And then one guy says, sir, this gas formula... Mm, I don't think it's used for camouflage. This this isn't dense enough, and this formula <laughs> contains some kind of mind control drug. And then the guy goes like, "Uh oh, okay, well, hey, take a look at this cane. Uh, it can uh, vary in weight from ten pounds to over two hundred. Bam!" And then he he kills the guy with his cane. <laughs> and the sound for the 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 murdering is F W U C K. Fuck. <laughs> Uh, I'm looking at that right now. Yeah, <laughs> I and didn't then, realize and then that. The, the Paragon Corps go like, "Oh my lord!" And then he goes like, "Well, um, yeah, you guys are gonna. I'm gonna release this gas on my own troops. You guys are gonna forget this ever happened." He dumps <laughs> the guy he just killed over this shoot. Yeah, it looks like you do an elevator shaft. Yeah, and then he just comes back to his troops that are just like, "Oh, what happened? Positions, man. We got a reception committee to prepare." <laughs> and I just thought that was so stupid. <laughs> And, and nobody on in in whatever city this is in, nobody seems to care that uh, that a newspaper owner has an army. Yeah, yeah, he's got an army. He's got a security <laughs> army. He's got a, a Disneyland likes a park as well. He's mm-hmm. got this huge building. He's he controls yeah. all the media in the country apparently. And yeah. in the in the page opposite from the. The, the section where Paragon kills that dude with with his cane. If you look at uh, if you look at Hyperkind, they're just sitting in their uh, secret hideout that had a hole in the wall that got fixed somehow. Yeah. And Amok is cutting salami with his two hands. <laughs> Do you see it there? Yes. Yes. He's, he's cutting salami while they're discovering while they're arguing about Paragon John, and you know the Paxes, yeah. and he's just chopping salami with his two blade hands. Yeah. I, I, this has to be this has to be like tongue in cheek. I mean, this has to be <laughs> purposeful. They were like, you know, screw it. Let's just make. Well, and then the, the next page after that, he gets mad at Armada over something. He says, "For now, just for now, though, just shut up and listen." And he cuts her chair in half while she's sitting in it, so she has to jump out of the way before she dies. Yeah, <laughs> and not to mention that when he cuts the chair, the chair was being created by Bliss. Yeah. So that hurts Bliss, too, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, it's just like, that's a mock. I mean, you know, <laughs> they show up in front of Paragon because Paragon said, these guys don't exist. This was obviously just a fake news. We don't believe these guys are real unless they want to show up near my building to be interviewed. And reveal themselves, yeah. And, and so, so their plan was to go in front of his building and get interviewed. And they debate so long, is this a trap? Yeah, this is a trap. Well, are we going to tr- into a trap? 
uh, well, you know. And then the next panel is them shouting, okay, non-believers, we're here. Action. So don't give us any flack. And, and <laughs> for some reason, the mock is tearing up everything around him and just throwing yeah. like chunks of rock in the air. Yeah, he throws and a police car in the air. He throws a police car in the air as well, because apparently, uh, and, you know. And, and Logic logic's says, I knew it was a trap. It's like, what good is having this super intelligent uh, strategist when no one will listen to I him? I know. And he says, we got to get out of here fast. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't it remind you when Amok sinks his blade hands into the floor, and then he just raises the squad car or, or paragon yeah. four car in the air does it remind you of like the berserkers and nightbreed doing the same oh yeah thing? yeah yeah exactly so and only then not as cool in one of the pages he actually says rawr yeah and he's he's slicing these uh troops but you don't actually it doesn't look like they're really getting hurt but they should be yeah, because this is a '90s comic, so yeah. Well, I mean, don't don't make his hands these giant axe blades if you're not gonna. I don't know. There was a point when George actually goes to a drug deal that goes sour, and then he turns into a mock and he slices up all the dealers in there and says, "You just signed your death warrant," and that's our hero. Yeah. <laughs> because he was doing a drug deal with his yeah. friend uh, Carlos, and and it went sour, and then he turns into a superhero and slices everyone. Yeah, that's the weird part about Hyperkind. Yeah, yeah, and it, th this this story doesn't go on long enough for them to become heroes that you care about. Yeah, the artwork it's okay. It gets a yeah. little sloppy in this issue for some reason, especially when they're fighting uh, yeah. the Paragon Corps their faces and the artwork becomes a little sloppy when there's like too many characters around. Yeah. Uh, and eventually what happens is that, you know, they're affected by that gas and uh, special weapons that Paragon had ready to uh, contain them. And he actually uh, puts them all in his... They've all got special prisons just for each one of them. Yeah, in his little dungeon. And it's mm -hmm. weird because he says, he starts a sentence when Armada gets knocked out outside of the building and then he completes a sentence when they wake up in his dungeon. Yeah, I noticed that too. <laughs> Foolish girl, there are no heroes. Yeah. She gets yeah. shot in the head, and then he, when they wake up, he says, there is only Paragon John. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah. Okay, that's issue number four. <laughs> issue okay. number five's cover is really funny. Yeah, oh, Paragon John looks really weird on the cover there. That's not what he looks like. That's He's really off-model compared to, he looks kind of rat-like. Meet the most dangerous man in the world, and then he's, like, yeah. smiling at the cover and says, oh, you're too kind. Yeah, and, and uh, Clive Barker, you know, had set the story up that, that uh, the Paxes were taken down by one of the we their weakest enemies because they squabbled and had internal str uh, political struggles within themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like this guy should be sort of just a joke. And he should be easy to defeat. On issue five, they start bringing in new inkers to the uh, comic book. And that, that makes the artwork seem different sometimes in some of the pages. Oh, yeah. Especially some of the uh, flashback scenes. I guess they were mm -hmm. inked by different people. It's funny because uh, Paragon John is talking about the story of, you know, how he met the Paxis, how he became... Uh, oh yeah, about Thermac. Yeah, these these faces look all smudged, uh, all smudged up of the of the Paxis. And there's this funny square here, this funny panel where um, he's he's like foaming at the mouth, <laughs> yeah. and the Paxis are uh, oh, restraining yeah. him because he says that uh, that alien's a monster. He'll destroy us, don't you see? He was talking about Thermac. Yeah, and the yeah, Paxis I'm looking at that one. Actually, had to restrain him, and he's like foaming at the mouth, still wearing his GI. Uniform, by the way. Yeah, and uh, and it looks like um, Escobacher has got his arm around his neck. Maybe I can't. It's hard to tell what's going on in this. Yeah, the anatomy is kind of weird. That's yeah, very very diff difficult to understand. Or he's wearing a bib. Sure. And then <laughs> he Paragon John says that he got sentenced to this uh, psychiatric hospital, where he got submitted to uh, the, the care of this doctor who would give him electroshocks and then that gave him the idea to kill his dad when he came home yeah and he got the doctor that to to help him yeah that's weird right i mean <laughs> he's like that doctor, guy turned out to be my friend <laughs> he's telling how traumatic it was to be under the care of that doctor but then he just goes back in and he creates these uh, monsters with uh, with this doctor these zaniacs yeah he decided to wipe the memory of paxis and he decided to destroy the paxis and he does that. 
in this issue, basically, the whole thing is Paragon John explaining to the hyperkind that are trapped in their little cells uh, how he tricked the whole world into thinking that there was no such thing as superheroes. And how he tricked the Paxes into giving up their powers. Yeah. And the dumb moment in this comic book is when he actually went to talk to the guy who had the power of God consciousness called Clarion. Yeah. And he was supposed to be the guy who could see anything. He had the uh, eye of God. And then he mm -hmm. says, um, you know, you, you're able to expand your senses beyond the limitations that we mortals share. You know, hey, uh, why don't you try to uh, use your power and become one with God? And, you know, just just don't contain it. You know, be one with it. Let it go. Mm -hmm. Clarion disappears in a wisp of smoke because... He's like, okay, I'll listen to this guy. <laughs> because he became one with the world. As soon yeah. as he opened up his God consciousness power, yeah. he just became one with the world and he disappeared. Yeah. In a puff of smoke, and I'm like, that's some, that's something that would be in like a Douglas <laughs> Adams book or something. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> uh, that's, I don't know. That's just that's just a weird story. For it me. would be hard to try to explain all of this in one issue of this comic book. They didn't have to try to do that. I think that's that's where it gets sloppy. And the artwork is really really over the top. There's one panel yeah. where Paragon is explaining how he created the Zona, and how he. Uh, he used this uh, drug to spread it around the world. You know, he yeah. spread, he he didn't spread it just in America or just no, yeah, the he whole spread it world, all over the world. There's like a panel where he's like the stereotypical mad scientist. He's like he's got a a red uh, bottle and a green bottle, a red bottle, a green bottle, a, a test tube, and an aerolinier. He's just pouring it into a giant yeah. tank. There's pipes everywhere. And then he goes like, I seeded Zona into the very clouds of the earth. My Zona soon made every life-giving drop of water a thief as well, stealing the memory of the Paxes from the world forever. So there was Zona drug in every single drop of water in the earth. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. I mean, how could he even possibly come up with the materials to do that? But then, you know, he eventually became this huge... Yeah. Uh, tycoon and media and you know I guess that helped to control the footage that was out there even though again how would people forget that there was a giant alien invasion there was a world war and the Pax mm -hmm. has helped win that alien invasion it yeah. just it just doesn't fly here that's no know. no I mean re it, this is this is so complicated and and it seems like it, it makes so little sense because it would be so much easier for him to just you know they they should have just stopped it at him figuring out ways to kill the Paxis. That makes sense. Yeah, the people would still remember the Paxis, but, you know. Yeah, but then making the whole Earth forget, I mean, it's flimsy. And no nobody, no matter how angry they are, would would go to that extreme to try to think of some way to get back at them. I'm going to erase your memory from the entire world and all written records. Yeah, <laughs> so that that is weird. It is, yeah. Yeah, and the story falls apart with that. It's funny because Paragon John is talking to Logica, and Logica says, well, you know what? We're just four of us. There's five powers uh, for the hyperkind. So I oh, guess logic. Yeah. the logic thing to do is for us to give you the, the fifth power so you can become a Paxis as well, which logically makes absolutely zero sense. Yeah. But what happened here was they go for the whole thing that well, Logica was trying to trick him, and he actually, instead of giving him the power, he just gave him a dose of his own drug, Zona, and mm -hmm. made him forget that he had captured the hyperkind. <laughs> and yeah. then he just came back and released his friends. They could have made him forget how to breathe. They could have made him. They could have made him forget that he wasn't five years old. There's all kinds of stuff that they could have done. I mean, they just they left him a villain. They they still left him exactly as he was the day before, you know, still with his plan of finding out the Paxis and, you know, destroying yeah. the Hyperkind. And that was silly. I think the execution for Hyperkind was very, I, I don't think the writer was very good. The yeah. art was okay. It became better in Unleashed, mm -hmm. but. Oh yeah. Yeah. For sure. The writing was flimsy. So here in, in number five also, um, the, you know, their hideout in that movie theater I spent every single issue thinking that somebody was going to discover their hideout because they they were really obvious about it. And it would be really easy for people to break in and, and t take all their stuff or sabotage it. I know. And they do go through a, a dialogue where they go like, 
hey, you know, we never saw any squatters up in Heliopolis Cinema. Oh, I mm-hmm. think that everyone who ever tried going in there, uh, they never – nobody ever heard of them again. So yeah. wouldn't that be like a mystery? Wouldn't people like try to figure out what's going on? Wouldn't people say, hey, uh, you know, uh, Lefty went in there last night and he never yeah. came back, so maybe we should go in and look for him? Yeah, or or if uh, some firemen go in there to rescue people and they disappear, it's like, okay, now we're getting the National Guard. <laughs> and so basically what? The, uh, the hyperkind – uh, Volt is killing people. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. know, but anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's not very nice. This takes place in L.A. of all cities. Yeah, it's funny because I always thought the Heliopolis Theater was meant to be a joke about the Egyptian theater. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that's the case, but yeah, it seems that way. It's got a, it's got a, a looks like a King Tut's tomb in front. Or I mean, a sarcophagus on the front. Yeah. So number number six is the one that's made sideways. Ugh. Yeah, that really irritated me. I, I, it was a chore to read that. And when you look at the cover, it just looks like nonsense. You have to really concentrate to try to figure out what's going on in it. There's too much stuff going on on the cover. Yeah, it's the Paxis versus the Vexus. Yeah. Yes. And then uh, what's his face comes in, Trip Monroe. Trip Monroe. This is this is the. Crossover with uh, Hokum and Hex. There's probably backstory from a previous issue of Hokum and Hex. Right. So w- when we get there, we'll go, oh, okay, that's what led up to number six of Hyperkind, because there's some stuff, story missing. And I can't stress enough how much I hate reading this comic book sideways like a calendar. <laughs> yeah. So the Vexus are these uh, super creatures that uh, are fighting the Hyperkind. They also have their own powers. The The battle goes on for... I would say maybe a third of the comic book. Yeah. And uh, eventually Trip Monroe helps them win the battle. There's a page here that you made it your Facebook cover. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when this Vexus woman traps Logica with cables and then mm-hmm. she makes them transform into cobras. Electric cobras, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> which, which are prettier, electric cables or electric cobras? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that question's been plaguing mankind since the dawn of time. Armada comes behind uh, this villain. She's a woman, and she shoots her with machine gun arms from the back. Says, "Back off, baby cakes!" And then she just gets thrown out of the building, but she's still alive and unharmed. So I, I would like to know how she managed to withstand being peppered yeah. by bullets. And this this battle goes on through most of the comic, and there's a lot of like trading one-liners and. St- and people uh, saying, like, people announcing their powers before they do them so that they can give their enemies a chance to, to dodge or whatever. It's really irritating. Like I, mean, I said, this, this villain that gets thrown out of the building, she goes like, no, the hole, I'll fall. It's like, yes, we can see that. You're falling through a <laughs> hole, and you are falling. So why, yeah. why would they give her the dialogue that, no, the hole, I'll fall? Yeah. That is why sequential art, yeah. you know, the, the art should speak for yeah. that. You don't need to add that there. And, then, and these, the, these bad guys have such weird, uh, weird uh, complicated powers that it takes a long time to explain what they can do, like this mammon. Mm-hmm. He he has he has cold gold, so it encases you with gold, and it makes you reflect on yourself and only be self obsessed. Yeah, <laughs> it's like uh, that's really that's really complex. Why would anyone want a power like that? The battle keeps going on, and ultimately the the, the whole issue is just the battle. And then at the end, they manage to. Um... Win, so to speak. It's more like the Vexus just decide to go away. Like, we're yeah, most and it, I, I would say the Vexus actually kind of win because they basically killed Armada. Yeah, they 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 didn't do anything to her. Actually, she did it to herself, which we will explain later. Oh yeah, but you, but but you didn't know that in this issue. You learned that in the next one. But the whole point about this one is that the Vexus are they want to find the Paxis. And they actually just fought the Paxis, but they have no idea they fought the Paxis. So, mm-hmm. well, yeah, who do they think they are fighting? We have wasted valuable time, time that might have been spent tracking the Paxis. And when we've killed them, we will deal with yeah. you. And then they go away. And I'm like, who do they think they were fighting with? <laughs> yeah, they, they, they think that most that most people on Earth are like that. 
don't they have like aren't if they're tracking the Paxis, shouldn't they have some idea that there's a yeah. guy who's logical, there's one chick that uses illusions, there's one guy who's really strong, and there's another chick that has a suit that you know it's like an armor that that's how it used to be in in the old Paxis, right, so wouldn't they like add two and two and think these might be the new Paxis, yeah. And uh, and then uh, Trip Monroe, the comedian, says, "For now, Vexus will no longer vex us." Vex us, yeah. Ah, I get it. And I <laughs> yeah. just want to punch him through the comic book. <laughs> I know. Yeah, but it, it, jokes are funnier when you have to explain them. So yeah, at the end, yeah. uh, Armada becomes this really old, desiccated woman, and she she's dying because uh, yeah. they see the Vex well, actually, killed her. Yeah, George says she's dead. The Vexus killed her. Oh, and actually, there's one one really cool thing in this issue. Mm -hmm. um, this page called The Razor's Edge. Yeah. From Doodles to Decamundi. So uh, it's got three Clive Barker sketches uh, of of characters from from the from this universe. So there's one sketch of Ecto Kid, uh, one of Saint Sinner, and one of a just birthed bull baby. Which we don't right now. We don't know what a bull baby is, but. It comes from the Saint Sinner comic books. Okay. Yeah, it's from the Saint Sinner comic books. So it's interesting. I've never seen I've never seen any uh, sketches from Clive for the Hyperkind or Hokum and Hex. I don't know if he ever made any. Yeah. But that's interesting. I've only seen I've seen these before <clears throat> a few times, but <clears throat> I've never seen any for the Hyperkind or for Hokum and Hex. Yeah. So something to look for. Yeah. These characters never show up again. These these bad guys. No, the Vexes never show up again. I think they were supposed to be villains for Hokum and Hex, but I I, I don't know. We'll oh, we'll get to that is... when when we get to Hokum and Hex, we'll figure that out. Yeah. So what happened in issue seven is that uh, Armada, <clears throat> when she shoots her guns, she's actually using up her uh, vital energy. Yeah. So when she was shooting her guns nonstop to release herself from one of the enemies, she actually uh, depleted her life force. And the only way that they can uh, find to rescue her is to put her back in the sarcophagus. Yeah, and, and but the, the way they figure that out is is circuitous and kind of crazy. Uh, they, they, they say, we, we'd better start paying attention to the nursery rhyme about the Paxis. And it's like, why? What, what yeah. does that have to do with anything? And the nursery rhyme, it, it's got some stupid words in it. I know. Like telejumpus. I'll tell you what the fax is. <laughs> what? what the yeah. Fax is? yeah, it's really? supposed to be like a, a jump rope rhyme, but it's it's awful. I can't go I can't go beyond the first two verses. Like pick yeah. faxes. I'll tell you what the fax is. Yeah. It's, Come with me on the shining path. <clears throat> and then mm -hmm. it goes uh <laughs> that's another part that's really stupid. Here. A strange gel, a chain gel. The city yeah. of the angel, I like, the place I have to start on the shining path. That is so stupid. It's yeah. like a strangel, a changel, the city of the angel, the place I have to start on the shining path. A starlight, a star bright, a griffin on a moon night, the second step for me on the shining path. A wampus, a compass, a northwest telejumpus uh, to view the steps to be on the shining path. Okay, the the whole thing is they're trying to be edgy here, and they're trying to come up with like a controversial thing. Yeah, Blitz. kind of like Freddy Krueger's thing, you know. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Well spotted, like the uh, one two Freddy's coming for you. Yeah. So what only, happened? Here only is, not nearly as good. Is that Bliss or Diane? She has she has a traumatized girl. Yeah, uh, and despite despite how stupid this nursery rhyme is. This is where I thought that the writing got a lot better. Yeah, well, at least it tries to get a little better because... It's uh, more mature and there's not people making jokes and, and, uh, and doing stupid things. Apparently this nursery rhyme is something that uh, survived from uh, the times of the Paxes, I would say. I don't know. Yeah, just, it was engineered by the people who are trying to keep the memory of the Paxes alive. Just don't try to uh, to look too much into this because, you know, it falls apart really easily. But at the same time, it's like, okay, we get what they're trying to do. Yeah. The nursery rhyme was supposed to tell them the place where they needed to go if they ever had to find, uh, I don't know, the Pax's headquarters. Yeah. We're not talking about Heliopolis or the place that has the sarcophagi. We're talking about a, a, a bigger base where there's still one of the surviving Paxes in there. 
So why weren't those two places together? Beats me. <laughs> <laughs> and then how was that lady living inside that place? Mm-hmm. But anyway, the thing is, they can't put her into the sarcophagi at the Heliopolis because Logica destroyed the computer that controlled the the system. Yeah. So they're, they had to... Uh, they had, can you understand why they had to go to that place first and talk to that uh, lady? I mean, they're following the clues... From the jump rope rhyme, and only Diane remembers it, and she has to go back to her traumatized childhood to remember the rhyme, and she keeps saying, don't make me do it, and they're like, hey, can, do we need to remind you that she's going to die? Just yeah. do it. But, but I yeah, they, I, they follow well, all the clues in the jump rope rhyme, and they make their way to this Pax of Space. But yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't, I don't understand why they, uh, they just discovered that this r- nursery rhyme would help them somehow... Uh, keep keep Lisa alive. Yeah, because all the thing they do is they go through the city and they discover this shining path that's basically just a big stairway on the side of a hill. Yeah. Uh, and I take that back of, with shining steps. <laughs> and I take that back about them not doing stupid things because when they're on their way to this secret base, mm-hmm. they uh, they basically burn a path to it. Like yeah. they, he, uh, like um, he, he doesn't want to. I mean, they're they're in a car, but he he wa- he gets out and and chops all the trees down. Yeah, he trailblazes through. Uh, oh, and they stole a Paragon a truck. To and go it's there. yeah, and it's graffito tagged all over the place, and it's been parked in front of the theater. Yeah, <laughs> and of course, a helicopter will show up from Paragon Corp. Yeah, and they they they're debating the whole way that this truck is driving. They're debating whether they should fight, stop the truck, and fight the helicopter, or if they should just keep on going. And they eventually decide they should keep on going. But one of those people could have jumped out and destroyed the helicopter while the rest of them kept going. And the reason why I don't understand this story is because they go through all the trouble to find that woman, the that surviving Paxis. Uh, yeah. And the only thing that she does is tell them, you have to go back to Heliopolis and put your friend in the sarcophagus. That's the only way that she'll survive. Yeah. Then Logica says, I accidentally screwed up the computer. Or Logics. Yeah, Logics. Logics. Yeah. So, and and I think at this point I was thinking, so the computer is screwed up so they can't do anything. But no, they just go there, they put her in the sarcophagus, and it starts rebuilding Lisa again into Armada. Yeah, and she says uh, she jumps out and says, "Hang on, world, Armada's back." I think this was all meant just to have them find this woman. Uh, yeah, right, because they they could have skipped that whole thing and yeah. just stuck her in the sarcophagus from the from the start. Yeah, so there's really nothing amazing yeah. that you know. Oh, interesting now, thing we didn't mention was that the first issue of Razorline sold out in two days, I think. Oh, did it really? Yeah, I think they they mentioned that in the letters. Uh, uh, the the um, the first cut. Yeah, no, the 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 first issues of Hyperkind in the. the oh letters. yeah, well I know I I bought them all. Yeah. Uh, but then I kind of made you know made the decision to not continue buying them after that. Oh. I did, I only yeah, I only just a couple of years ago bought the rest of these. Yeah. Uh, sure. I, I at the time I think I also only got. Hecto Kid, all the Hecto Kids, and then mm-hmm. I got a few other assorted ones. Because at the time, I, I only got those Hecto Kid issues because I, I visited Canada, and I was yeah. there when this came out. I went there in August of 93. So these were coming out. I met Steve Scrose. He he, uh, he made me a drawing of Hecto Kid, which I think we will put that in the beginning of this episode mm-hmm. because we talked about this last week when we were waiting for Thomas Ngoven, and I'm going to right. edit that part into the podcast sure yeah yeah probably the opening so um yeah so at the time i was living in portugal and i had no ready access to american comics they had to be imported in uh mm-hmm. and there weren't many places that would do that so i i also only got all the comic books a few years after they came out oh yeah i got you mm-hmm. so book eight brings the return of tempest uh yeah which was a Paxis. And Tempest hasn't aged. And as far as I can tell, there's no good explanation. Yeah, and did you understand uh, what her power was? I thought there were supposed to be only five powers. Well, she's supposed to be like 
amok, right? She was the werewolf woman. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah, but then, uh, yeah, but at one point she does, uh, doesn't she actually get her power briefly? Yeah, I don't know why. I don't, it doesn't, I don't understand this. Yeah, I don't understand it either. <laughs> but anyway. I don't understand what she's even doing in this issue. And I, um, and she dis- she's, she's gone again. I, you don't hear from her again after this issue. Yeah, I didn't really understand what happened here. Uh, yeah, you know? I mean, I and I, you know, I read a lot of these staying up late, and I kept drifting off and and wondering if I messed up, you know, or I missed something. I think I, that what they were trying to do in this issue was introduce a subplot where this this lady, Tempest, she would mm-hmm. join up with the Zaniacs. She would join up with the Zaniacs to um, to to try to uh, avenge. <clears throat> Uh, uh, the death of her friends uh, get revenge from Paragon John. Yeah. But then they never show her again. So, yeah. And she never really got her powers back. She just – that's a recollection. She's re- recalling when the uh, – Right. She has muscle memory of – like she can fight and she can like do acrobatics and stuff. Yeah. The thing about these comic issues is that I was reading them and I was getting confused about them as well. So – it's not that we didn't do our homework for this episode. It's that these comic books, th- these comic book issues are confusing to some point. Yeah. When you don't even know what's going on and why subplots are being introduced, or you know. Yeah. And this is a perfect example. They bring back this Tempest. She's in the cover with her powers, but yeah. then in the book, she she never really gets her powers. So. Well, I don't... and for for Paragon John thinking that he killed all of the Paxis, there sure are a lot of them uh, left alive. Yeah. Well, this one was the one that got demolecularized. Yeah. And apparently it said off 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 screen, so to speak, off page, it said that Paragon John killed the Z Man who had demolecularized her. And her and the Z Man's victims were getting a second chance. I don't know. So I don't know how that yeah. would work. But she reforms her own body and she is uh she's taken by Paragon Core. Yeah. And uh, they they inject her with uh, Zona, and uh, it turns out that she has a lot of memories. And and the doctor is like, well, she has a lot of memories of the Paxis, more than usual people do. So I wonder, you know, she's so young, how can she remember so much? And then the Zaniacs um, rescue her from this facility where she's being held by John Paragon John. Yeah. And she just vows revenge, and that's the last we see of Tempest. Yeah. I wonder, so for, you know, for the purpose it, of this this comic arc, this this issue doesn't move the story forward at all. No, no, it doesn't. It, you know, they just show the Xeniacs, which look like kind of mole man. Uh, yeah. And you know, she would be, she would be uh, joining up with the Xeniacs. But I thought the Xeniacs, I thought the Xeniacs followed Paragon John. So how she? I how did too. I remember thinking that, and then I read this, and I got confused. Maybe these are the uh, deformed Xeniacs who want revenge on Paragon John as well for what he did to them. Maybe there are some that are like mindless soldiers and some that aren't. Yeah, it's never really clear what what they want to do here. So yeah, the, yeah, I think they had too many subplots and they didn't realize uh, how quickly that this comic was going to come to an end. Because the, this the, is the Xeniacs, remember, the Xeniacs actually tell her. That the Paxis are killers. <laughs> and yeah. It's gonna, I, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't hold yeah. as an issue. Yeah, it's like why if they're enemies of Paragon John, why are they giving her bad information about the the hyperkind? Yeah, it seems like these Xeniacs are both against Paragon John and against the Paxis. But she's a yeah. Paxis. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And I just don't understand what they were going for here. It's very weird. Yeah. And it was weird to introduce this subplot when the next issue, the very next issue, was going to be their last one. And obviously they didn't know that. Yeah. But, I mean, I thought that most of the time people are writing these issues like two at a time or, you know, back to back pretty much. It seems like a really abrupt end. Uh, When they made – so the next one, number nine, when they made that, they knew that it was the last issue – and uh, in the letters at the end, they were talking about how they would get two more specials. So they would get one special in the summer and then another one in the fall. But it turns out that I don't think they ever got those. They got 
it, well, un- un- next year they got yeah. Uh, uh, Unleashed was in was uh, was in the the fall. Yeah, that was September of ninety four. Right. Yeah. Here. So it was like four months or something later after because number nine was in May, and then uh, was in May of ninety four, and then um, and then Unleashed was in September of ninety four. Yeah. So what is that? Five months or something like that. Sure. Yeah. You know, and and at the end of this issue, they get an old enemy of the Paxis, which was Doctor Lazarus, I think, and, and yeah. now he's turned into an android, Lazarex Prime, which <laughs> obvious comparison, Optimus yeah. Prime or anything that has Prime in the name. Yeah. So this guy shows up uh, at the uh, old Paxis headquararter, and uh, the the lady that's living there, she uh, she confronts this guy, and the last issue is. Th- the the next issue is the last face the fury of Lazarex. Yeah. So and and this the the opening of this this guy basically followed the hyperkind to the secret Paxis base where they blew the door open and he could just walk right in. Yeah. There, there's actually there's like a couple of issues where the lady's complaining, come back and fix my door. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, and so this guy comes in and he's threatening her and but luckily they're talking for a long time. And she gets out a secret walkie-talkie that she had apparently given to the hyperkind, yeah. but we didn't actually see that in the last episode. Well, Do- Dr. Lazarus actually had a crush on this uh, Paxis that he's confronting right now. Yeah. Uh, he got tricked by one of the Paxis with the illusion power to believe that he was going to kiss her, but he was kissing his robot instead. And this yeah. robot kind of electrocuted him. Yeah, and he got fried, and it melted the flesh off of him. Yeah, that was a pretty awful trick that uh, the wh- whatever the dream lady's name was in the original Paxis. Uh, Lushka, I think. I don't yeah, know. Uh, that I mean that's pretty horrible. And they're like laughing at him, and uh, and they left him for dead. Yeah, and it turns out that his robots, his surviving robots, uh, grabbed his body. And they were like, well, he created us. We can't let him die. So they spent years working on his half-dead corpse until uh, they replaced his nerves with circuits and turned him into a robot. And apparently he resurrected as Lazarex Prime. They actually used their own parts to fix him. Yeah. So his and, robot and friends. That doesn't explain why he has like a spider face with weird spider teeth. Yeah, and, and eyes everywhere, you know. So yeah. anyway – He's talking to uh, the, this lady, uh, Loshka, mm-hmm. and the first thing she does after he finishes the story is somehow she grabs a huge freaking gun from her robe and starts shooting him. Yeah. And it's like, oh, I've got a special deflector shield thing. Yeah, but it's funny because that she just grabs a huge machine gun out of her robe and just goes, pop, 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 pop. Yeah. And, uh, yes. So, meanwhile... The Paxis or the Hyperkind uh, are, you know, they are in their stolen truck from Paragon. Yeah, it and, like and it was parked robot. out right out front of the theater, and all these punk kids were like gra- graffitiing it. Yeah, and the, one of the guys says that looks like something out of a moon landing, which it's true. It's it's a huge yeah. conspicuous <laughs> yeah. van, but it looks uh, like Dead Reckoning from from uh, Land of the Dead. And as soon as they start moving it, of course, uh, Paragon John helicopter follows them uh, yeah. to the place where they're going, which is the place where Loshka is uh, facing uh, Lazarex. As soon as they get there, the first thing that happens is, oh, no, we got a helicopter on our tail. But it's okay. Lazarex Prime destroys the helicopter immediately. Yeah. And uh, they turn themselves into, uh, you know, hyperkind. Time to power up. And it's it's just weird. The way they win is basically Logica jumps into the guy's circuitry and he short circuits him, but then he gets stuck inside uh, Lazarex Prime. Which is exactly what happened to her the last time. Yeah. Because she she was Logica. Right. She was Logica. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's why so her name was Logica, had... and then yeah. she became Logica. The only person who could take her out of the circuitry was uh, the guy with the, the, the consciousness. consciousness. Yeah. yeah. So they're like, okay, we better, if we want to rescue our friend, we better figure out who stole our fifth power. Because uh, a while back, we didn't mention this, but uh, somebody had already used up the power in the in the sarcophagus. So there was a fifth Paxis member out there somewhere. Yeah. And uh, this is really silly. I wonder, this might have been like a Clyde Barker thing. 
because it has all the traces of it. But then when they're trying to triangulate, they can detect where the power is and the key because they all have a key, the, the key mm-hmm. where they activate their power. And then they also have a spare key, apparently, because one Logica, the old Logica tells them, you also have a spare key, right? And it's like, we have a spare Oh, yeah, that's right. I did have two keys. I told, and she's like, I put one of them into the sarcophagus to get it to work. Yeah. And so they are going to triangulate where the uh, God consciousness key is, which is this kind of Egyptian-looking eye. Mm-hmm. And so they go to different places in L.A., and they try to detect it using a map of L.A. that Logix finds inside Lazarus Prime's brain. And they discover yeah. that it's in Venice Beach. And then they go like, oh, man, everybody in Venice Beach looks like a superhero. How are we going to find, you know, that other Paxis guy? So they go there, and uh, and there's this – for some reason, there's this huge mm-hmm. Egyptian-themed painting on the wall in a building yeah. in front of the beach. And then one of them looks up and says, that eye just winked at me. And it turns out that yeah. that eye was the consciousness. Yeah. Uh, God consciousness thing. And it's in the shape of a, a dog god. Yeah, and the dog god is called Eka. Eka was the dog that was following Xbox. Ek- yeah. Ex- Xbox guy. <laughs> <laughs> Xbox guy. This, this is so. I mean, we're gonna have to do a lot of editing on this episode. So, so basically, if you trace it back, uh, the day that that somebody, somebody, the dog snuck into their place, secret hideout. Yeah, into their secret hideout, snuck into the sarcophagus and programmed it to shut on him and turn him into a superhero. Yeah, he grabbed the the globe that uh, that Thermak had, and uh, because this was, I think this was one of the powers that Thermak had within his own grasp. But yeah. in the first issues, they took it out of him and they kept it. They kept the fifth power. So yeah. and then it disappeared out of nowhere. So I think yeah. this dog, like you said, found a way to become. The God Consciousness. Yeah. Which is amazing. And then uh, the way they get him to help them against... And here's an ad for a Guns N' Roses album. (laughs) Yeah. The way they get Eka to help them get logics out of the body of Lazarus Prime is Bliss transforms into Xbox Xbox guy. (laughs) And uh, I'm going to call him Xbox guy from now on. Because that's the only thing that, that comes in my mind when I say... Eskbacher, E S C H B A C H E R. Oh, and uh, and whenever the dog talks, mm. uh, his speech bubble looks like a pyramid. Yeah, <clears throat> like a polygon. Yeah. Bliss turns into X box guy, and yeah. uh, she tells him, "Your loyalty and help are needed, Eka. You, know, you yeah. got to help us free our friend." And then, of course, uh, he follows them. He goes there, and he he gets logics out. Yeah. So, and then he goes like, "Well, you know, I'm, I'll help you guys. I know, I know that you guys were tricking me because Xbacher is dead. Uh, his his smell was different from yours. His he smelled like old wine, cigarettes, car exhaust, hamburgers. That was X Xbox guy's perfume. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, that's great. Uh, car exhaust, old wine. Yeah. yeah, hamburgers. So he says, well, you know." Um, Whatever you, whenever you need my loyalty and help, it, it doesn't matter. You, you speak the truth, and I will help you. And then it ends on this cliffhanger that seems like the end of the beginning, <laughs> where uh, Loshka, the old Paxis, says mm-hmm. that uh, you know we have to keep the uh, Paxis alive, so we have to revert Paragon John's brainwashing. You guys have the future in your hands, and. I trust you guys will do the right thing. And uh, that's the last issue. Yeah, so it you, it kind of looked like they were, le- you know, with that, that last panel that they were leaving it. So if this was their ver- the very, very last thing that they did, it looked like at least they had an ending. Yeah, but it's <clears> like, <throat> like I said, like the end of the beginning. Like, like yeah. they're just figuring out – they're still figuring out who they are, yeah. you know, how to use their powers – they just discovered the fifth guy, the fifth Paxis power is taken yeah. by a dog. And um, yeah. for the Unleashed, they went to the well, first issue, and they grabbed something that Thermak was talking about, which was that he needed the powers of the cool to 
take them to another planet because there was another war that was going yeah. on there, and those powers were needed. Well, and back on on number nine in the letters column, uh, basically the the uh, Fred Burke was 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 writing about, hey, tell all your friends to buy Hyperkind, buy all the back issues, tell your comic books to that you want a special order more. Um, you know, they were basically desperate to keep this going because it was obviously failing and they were given a, an ultimatum that they could do two more specials and that's it, um, unless yeah. it sells really well. He, he does say, we've got enough <clears throat> stories to fill this book for quite a while. I should point out that Hyperkind is here for you, our readers. Let us know which stories you love, which stories you hate. It's the yeah. only way we can promise to deliver the comic book reading experience you crave. See you this summer, which would turn into fall. Yeah, um, but I think at this point they already knew that you know these things were gonna go yeah, away. The, yeah, and the writing was on the wall. Not just uh, because the writing may have been lackluster, and I, I don't know exactly how well they did in terms of selling the issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do go on about the first issue selling out in like two days or whatever. Yeah. But I was in Canada and I saw a lot of those comics were still on the shelves and they were coming out. Mm. So the thing is, um, it's sad. It's sad because every time something like this happens, Clyde Barker has a chance to create this this wonderful universe, and and it, it the execution fails at some point. Yeah. Well, he's giving it over to somebody else that doesn't really right. get what he was going for. Right. Because you know someone is someone else is put in charge of it. He just creates the idea. And then he gives it away for someone else to develop. And I think – I understand that Clive does that because that's how he works. He likes to create stuff. But he doesn't dwell too long on the same project. He can't really yeah. – he can't really – unless – except for Aberat right now, which is a huge undertaking. Yeah. I don't think Clive ever dwelled too much in a single project. And uh, he just moves on and starts something new. He yeah. goes on and starts taking pictures or he starts painting you know, stuff. Well, and every once in a while he'll get ideas or or uh, notes for something like he's got notes for sequels to Cabal and he's got notes for the third book of the Art and yeah and but, he's got notes for the second Galilee and all kinds of stuff but yeah but, but uh, like he people, hasn't sat down and written them in order but it's like people like this this was coming up on conversation in Occupy Midian the other day people mm -hmm. were like well why didn't he just you know keep on writing Cabal after Nightbreed came out yeah. Yeah. If he was going to do a trilogy, why didn't he ever write a trilogy? And uh, because that's not how he operates. It, yeah. he just, I guess he just finishes something, and then he wants to move on into something completely different. He keeps yeah. he keeps pushing the envelope, pushing the boundaries. He keeps going in different directions. He doesn't. Well, and if, if if he had gone on and written the sequels to Gabal, we may never have gotten Imagica. So quite true. Yeah, I can you imagine that. I mean, <clears throat> Imagica is, you know, it, his it, masterpiece. It, it, yeah, it's it's Imagica is probably. I mean, I hate to say this, but it's probably more important than Cabal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 a beautiful book. I think. Yeah. It's one of the books that Clyde Barker is going to be well known for. I mean, mm -hmm. in, the, in the decades to come, that's going to be Imagica. Yeah. I mean, and, people re remember. Obviously, they remember the ones that got adapted into movies more. Uh, but Imagica, for the people who read his books, you know, who are fans of his books, Imagica is, is huge. Yeah, his he wrote that thing from putting the pen to pencil to giving it to his editor and finally publishing it. It took like eighteen months, which is insane when you consider, yeah. you know, other parts of his career where his output took longer to finish the project yeah yeah it's kind of like we were talking with with thomas nigovin about how he's he works fast and kind of aggressively because he's got these ideas that he just can't get out fast enough yeah in, in fact in in a lot of interviews he even mentioned sometimes that when he writes he starts <clears throat> to forget to blink and and eat and sleep yeah, and at some point that really affects him, and it really makes him uncomfortable after a it's while. It's kind of this weird fugue state, which yeah. always made me because um, I, I, you know, I, uh, whenever I would write, I would want to be like him, and I try to do write by hand, and I give up, and you know, switch to a computer because it's so much faster. Yeah, it's true. 
I mean, but maybe it probably it wouldn't be for him if he's if he's not really good at typing, which well, we I think he probably isn't good at typing. Yeah, uh, he's old fashioned in that way. I mean, yeah, I could, I could, I could, I could see that. We, well, we know that he has a very special uh, set of things he does when he writes. He writes in longhand, several drafts, and then he reads his book aloud at least once. And that's one of the reasons why he threw a whole draft of Aberat 2 in the garbage. Um, oh. Because he read it aloud after he finished. He was just about to send it to his editor, and he decided to read it aloud, and he didn't like it. And he binned the whole thing, and he started it over. Oh. Yeah. Can you imagine? And he says he threw it away. He doesn't even have it anymore. And I'm like, that's oh, my whole... God. Oh. I can't believe it. Like, there was a completely yeah, it, it, different if version. If I was of working there, I would go I would go grab that back <laughs> out of the garbage and file it away somewhere. Yeah, like like It's like you on. don't you probably don't mean that. I mean we should we should archive this at least. Yeah. But anyway, there there was a completely different Aberat too that he just dumped in the garbage because he mm -hmm. read it aloud and he didn't think it worked, so he decided yeah. to start from scratch. Yeah, and that you know, and 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 it's kind of a shame that, that uh you know that 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 whatever was going on at at Harper Collins that they didn't want to continue to give him the leeway for for that sort of thing anymore. Yeah. So the world, I guess, the publishing world is different now. Well, you know, it's it's hard even for writers who do go in the same direction for decades yeah. or for years. It's it's hard sometimes. <clears throat> it becomes very set. It saturates your mind. Like look at uh, look at George R. R. Martin who's writing the Game of Thrones series i yeah. mean people are on his you know people are complaining all the time you know george needs to finish this before he dies because he says there's still two books to go but it, it's been like 14 years or whatever and, and they're very concerned about it and it's yeah. like it, which isn't it isn't very nice to you know to say hey you're old and you're gonna die and this is what I want from you, so you better hurry up and get it done before you're a corpse. Yeah, it's not nice, but at the same time, yeah. it's easy to understand because these people get so absorbed by this work that it that you know they don't want to imagine that they might not be able to see the end of the story. Well, and it does happen all the time. My brother's a huge fan of the Wheel of Time books by Robert Jordan. Yeah. And there was like 14 or 12, I don't know how many of those, and and then he died before he finished the last like couple or something. Yeah, but he knew he was going to die. He knew that he had eighteen months to live, and and yeah. that helped him put his stuff together. Yeah, and but, uh, you know. But Clive Barker's not a Robert Jordan, so he's not going to make a whole bunch of predictable sequels in one big long series. Uh, he's got a lot of different ideas and a lot of different books. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? Well, you know. Let's hope that we can still get to see all those books come up. Uh, so at Hyperkind Unleashed number yes. one of one <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, came out in September of 94, like you said. And do you want to talk about it? Uh, well, the first thing um, when I opened this was I was really impressed by the quality of the paper and the inking and, and uh, the art. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, done, it's done much better, and it, it, it really felt like you know, as much as you hate when a comic series comes to an end abruptly and they don't get a chance to, to finish, it really felt like Marvel was saying, okay, give me your best shot, make this the absolute best you possibly can, and see how well this sells, and maybe we'll let you keep going. And it looks like they really did the best that they could. It seems to me, yeah, like this was uh, a, a trial to see if they should continue. And yeah, and they, the, 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 ironically, this this issue is called Hyperkind No More. Mm, yeah, and they did this for all of the. Uh, I think they did this for all of the Razorline comics. Yeah, and I um, haven't gotten there yet. But. It was also an interesting way to conclude or wrap up some loose threads that they had from the stories. Yeah, like the, this. I think it's in this one where they explain the blo black blobs. Yeah, this is the one where they explain the black blobs. They explain a, a, a part of the beginning of this comic book is a kind of a retrospect for anybody who hadn't read the other ones. Mm -hmm. They go over the whole origin of the Paxis and who they yeah. blah, blah, blah. So because it's a number one, so yeah, somebody picking it up is gonna not is gonna expect to 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 understand the backstory of these people. 
So they they now live with Amber Trans, which is that old lady that used to be a Paxis. Yeah. Did they and, wonder if they relocated the sarcophagus over there? I don't know. And um, and then they decide to tell her who they are. And this is a weird thing where she asks, "Your human identities? You still preserve them?" Yeah, it's which, like why would a muck want to be like that? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Like, I really have to go to the bathroom, so I'm going to change into George. No, you can't. Right. <laughs> yeah, but but I got blades for arms. How am I going <laughs> to, yeah. you know, use my pee-pee? Yeah. But, yeah, the original Paxis didn't ever switch back into their human forms because I guess they liked it so much. Probably. And, and they didn't have blades for arms. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So Carlos, who is George's friend, George is a mock. Yeah. Uh, he's involved with gangs, and uh, there was some kind of like drug deal that went wrong, and there was like a, a drug-related gang battle in the beginning of the comic book. The the Hyperkind kind intervened and ended the fight, and uh, Carlos is hanging around a place where George is, is going to, and he's, he notices that George is transforming from a mock back into George. Yeah. And then he goes like, he, you know, George, I know who you are. You know, I saw the, the Blades dude, and I know, you know, that you're him. Mm-hmm. And it's like, hey, but that's pretty good because we're on Easy Street. We can rob a bank, and we can pay everyone that we owe money to and get them off our backs. Yes. And that's not what George wants to hear. He's like, you don't get it. You know, we, we can't be thugs all our lives. We have to, you know. We yeah, have and to- not, he doesn't just say, hey, you don't get it. He, like, grabs him by the throat. Pushes him down on the ground and aims his fist at him. And have you noticed how George changed skin tone? In, yeah. Uh, he was like an, uh, a white kid in the other one, and this one he's brown. <laughs> yeah. He's, well, and I thought he was Asian too before. I, it's just weird. I don't know. George yeah. is one of those characters, they changed him around a bit. So in yeah, this because one. Because he, he spends most of his time as a muck, so. Yeah, you know, I don't even know yeah. if he's supposed to be Mexican, if he's supposed to be black, or he's supposed yeah. to be, what is he? I don't know. He's got a friend called Carlos, and yeah. I don't know. His hair is kind of blue. Anyway, so what what happens here is that uh, 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 Dream... And they couldn't help themselves in this, this and, panel where he's pushing his Carlos down on the ground and he's going to punch him. Mm. He looks huge and muscly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... It's like we're comic artists. We can't we can't not make them look like that. But anyway, Amber Trance explains to uh, Logica Bliss, Lisa Armada, Lisa Armada yeah. um, that actually they're th- the battle between the Herusians and the uh, Anubisti. Oh yeah, so it's Anubis and Horus basically. Yeah, Anubis and Horus, right? The battle that happened in Earth that caused them to cause Thermak to bring the powers of the Paxes there is happening in another planet right now. All these Herusians and uh, Anubisti are causing, you know, a war where they're killing a bunch of aliens in another planet. And that was the reason why Thermak wanted to get the powers back in the beginning of the first comic book. Yeah. Because he needs them to maintain you know, this balance across the universe. He shouldn't have threatened them, though. I mean, why couldn't he just bring them all over there or he could have talked to them about it? Right, because, you know, it's Marvel. So yeah. if superheroes meet or two creatures meet, they're going to fight. Yeah. And George appears as a mock, and mm-hmm. they tell him, you know, hey, we may need to give our powers back. You know, we we don't know if we're the right people. We don't know if our powers are a good thing for Earth. You know, Armada is having second thoughts because one of the kids, uh, one of the gang kids died in the battle that opens this comic book. And, you know, someone is aiming aiming a gun at Armada and she got out of the way and a kid behind her died. So she's like, are we really superheroes? We're just kids, you know, are we really the right people to wield this power besides? Yeah, which is which is kind of it's kind of a a metacognition a little bit because this is. uh, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of like the writers here are saying, do we deserve to keep on going or not? Yeah, but of course, uh, they tell this to Amok, and he mm-hmm. hasn't seen the images from, you know, the other planet with the Herusians and the Nubisti uh, waging warfare. So he's like, no, you know, you guys are cowards. You want to quit. You don't have the heart for the job. I want and, to remain. And, and Earth is bad, and, this, you know, there's all the stuff going down on the streets, and 
yeah. we're here to clean up, clean it up, and make the world a better place, and you guys are cowards, and so forth. Yeah, and then Logica says, you know, just watch the screen, and you know, and and he sees he sees the images, and he's like, well, but that came from Thermac. How do we know that's true? You know, how does how do we know the footage from Sigma D in the Orion system is is real? You know, and uh, you know, they just decide that. They have to decide the truth on their own. So, have yeah. to solve your differences with Thermac. Go and talk to him because he's an honorable guy, and you know he might, you know you you guys have him wrong. You know he's actually a better guy than you give him credit for. So at this point, I was confused because Paragon John had said that the Paxis were tricked by Thermac, and he really just wanted to use them to take over the Earth. And yeah. and we never saw anything to to contrast that other than Paragon John was a bad guy right. but there wasn't any evidence saying that that was wrong up until now and it's like oh well he Thermac is really a good guy and we and we like him yeah but in retrospect when you go read those comic books it does seem like Thermac was trying to get the powers to take them back to another planet in fact mm -hmm. he says that in the beginning but um so, well, he tells them that he they can give their powers back or he can kill them. Right. So he never really tells them that he wants to take over the Earth. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the things that I think they wanted to make clear with this comic book was that, you know, they wanted to go back to what Thermak was saying and say this this actually was a plot. <clears throat> but yeah, uh, yeah. what happens next is that they do go into Thermak's uh, refuge. And they do meet Thermak in mm -hmm. Gaiangazin, which is this oh, golden city inside this alternate dimension. There's one panel here where uh, where Amok says, "No spit, Sherlock." Yeah. Why did why, if they why can't they just make them say something else? If they can't swear, they shouldn't put substitute words in there that are hokey like that. Well, in the beginning, uh, when they're fighting in the opening battle, one of them says, "Son of a." <laughs> and they, and they yeah. put uh, colons. And it trails off. Yeah, it's kind of like the TV version of Die Hard 2. Oh, yeah. When yeah. They, they, they did a TV version where he says, Ipikaye, Mr. Falcon. <laughs> <laughs> or or uh, the TV version of, of, uh, of Beverly Hills Cop where they're like, I'm going to shove that bottle so far up your nose, you'll be sneezing something for a week. Or, or when they got Samuel Jackson on the TV version of Snakes on a Plane saying, I've had it with these monkey fighting snakes on this Monday to Friday plane. <laughs> Did that really happen? It's on YouTube. You can go and check it oh, out. I, I didn't know there was a TV version of – I've never even seen Snakes on a Plane. Yeah, that's one of the things – since I moved to the U.S., uh, I've given up on watching movies on the TV because they're all cut to heck. They're yeah. all chopped and cut, and there's nudity and blurring, and there's like – you know, and I yeah. get so disappointed. Back in Portugal, we got the DVD versions of the movie on TV. That's you know nobody would oh, really? care. Yeah, nobody would yeah. even care about cutting them for TV. They just put the whole movie there, and then we don't yeah. have any anything against them. But here, yeah. it's like they're so neutered when you see. Yeah, like, yeah, because they TV. have to be they have to be cut down to rated PG basically. And I'm like, well, but this is a cable channel. I'm paying extra for it, and it's like, oh, it's yeah. All but only only the subscription cable channels like HBO and Showtime can show like rated R stuff. Right. So, but anyway, going back to this, so yeah. they meet Thermac, who's like meditating on the top of a golden, you know, city yeah. or whatever. And, uh, hey, we want to talk to you. And then, of course, there's, like, a big battle. Uh, yeah. You can't big... just talk to Thermac. you got to yeah. fight him first. Yeah, you got to fight him. Because there's, like, thieves in my, in my you know, inner sanctum. Oh, you've mastered the power in only two fortnights? And, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, Bliss penetrates Thermac's mind. And she realizes that Thermac comes from uh, this uh, people and uh, who chose him to house the violent impulses of his uh, society. Maybe that's why he's so angry all the time. Yeah. And he was charged with empowering others to protect innocence, innocence of their worlds. That's how it says here. Yeah. While never hindering the war between the Harusians and the Inubisti. So the war would, should not end, but he should 
stop it when it went to other worlds. So I don't get I don't get exactly what he was supposed to do. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense why he would why he's not allowed to end the war. In exile, under penalty of death, you must fight as our lone warrior to preserve the universe. So I don't really understand what he was supposed to do. Because whenever he created the Paxis, they would defeat the Herusians and Anubisti. And the mm-hmm. war would end in that planet because they would just move out. But they would continue to do war somewhere else. And then he would have to go after them and stop their war in another world by creating another team of Paxis. So how is that not trying to make the war end? You know, I just, just don't yeah. understand. So, yeah, so they finally realized that it's true. He was telling the truth. Uh, and maybe they should give up their powers. But guess what? Uh, Eka, the dog, shows up. Mm-hmm. And all he knows is that Thermak killed his master. So he's going to have to fight to try to kill Thermak. And... Uh, yeah. And then there's this giant ship that comes out of the water. <laughs> and I think ultimately Eka ends up understanding that there's some justice and some balance that needs to be maintained. So he releases Thermak and his spaceship and he puts mm-hmm. the sarcophagi in the ship. They're supposed to go into the sarcophagi and surrender their powers. So Thermak can be, you know, taken away from Earth and, and go create the Paxis in another world. Yeah. But Amok does not want to give away his powers. Yeah. It's weird, because then x shows up from mm-hmm. the computer. x is dead, but he's not dead. He's part of the computer of the system yeah. that controls the sarcophagi. And then, for some reason, he waits until everyone is in the spaceship, and the sarcophagi are, is in the spaceship, and he decides to attack Thermak because he killed him, even though he's mm-hmm. not really dead, he's a computer program, and now the Hyperkind have to fight x because they say, oh, you're the bad guy, you're the one who's trying to turn us into your pawns to make Earth yeah. a better place. It, you know, does this make any sense? No, yeah, it's weird, and, and it, it, I think that it, they changed his character in service of the story. And then x becomes really xenophobic because he says... Thermak claims other worlds might perish without the Praxis powers, but what what does that matter? Humankind must take pre- precedence over alien filth. Such is our yeah. destiny. And that's when, of course, x becomes the bad guy. And they defeat him. Yeah. Well, they don't defeat him, actually. He takes their powers. <laughs> so he takes their powers, but even though he's losing his powers, George manages to slash x in his computer program form somehow. And... Mm-hmm defeats him because he whacked him on the chest. Yeah, with his hand. With his hand, not a, not even his claws. So yeah. what happens here is that he he breaks the transfer of powers from their bodies to x and their powers are given back to them, but somehow diff- in a different form, in an overload, and they become supercharged hyperkind. And Amok gets a hand, yeah. even though his other hand is still a blade. Yeah, at least uh, he's got one hand that's got three fingers on it. Yeah, he says, uh, now I can count at least to three. Yeah. Uh, Bliss gets a bikini, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. They don't really explain what her deal is. And, These new and, duds are styling, dude. And, yeah, uh, styling with an, with an uh, apostrophe. Yeah, so they're transformed. Uh, and and Logic Logic's, becomes... Logics is all black instead of white. And... Uh, Lisa, or uh, Armada, has a smaller armor now. We can see cleavage, which is a good thing, I guess. And uh, Yeah, and she doesn't have guns for arms. She doesn't have guns for arms, and, uh, you know... Oh, and she's got, like, a sight over her eye, like a red thing. And the problem that is... there before? Huh? Oh, that... no. She used to have two huge... Yeah, they were goggly, like, insect eye-looking things. Yeah, and now and she now, only has, she... like, one red eye, and the other one is her human eye. Yeah. What happened here is that, of course, when they defeated x they destroy the computer again, and the sarcophagi guy yep. in the system, that's all destroyed. So now they cannot transfer the powers ever. Now they're, they have to keep the powers, or at least they need to create uh, the technology again. But only the Kuo can do that. So I think that what they were going for now is that the spaceship would take Hyperkind to the other world, to the Kuo world, 
where yeah. they would have to uh, surrender their powers there, I guess. Yeah, and they, and they were like, hey, hey, Sir Matt, can you take us back? And uh, we know they're going to kill you, but can you please do it anyway? He's like, yeah, I guess. And again, Eck of a Dog shows up, and again he goes like, oh, you killed x Walker, and, you know. He... And I think that is partly misinterpretation by the uh, hyperkind, because the inner monologue of Eka is, now comes the part in this drama that only I can play. Though they yeah. not understand my actions, I still must send them to their greater destiny. And then they go like, oh no, the dog is still loyal to x Walker. He's betrayed us. And apparently he hits their spaceship. Yeah, he punches it. Off. He punches it, and he throws their spaceship offline, of course, for light years, as it was jumping into hyperspace, I guess. Yeah. And it it comes out the other side in the middle of uh, a battle. Which, which is, is actually, the war that they were looking at on the TV series. Yeah, I think that they were, they were planning to go to Kuo, mm -hmm. the planet of Thermax people, to get technology and restore take their powers away from them yeah. because the, the sarcophagi weren't working but then he just decided Eka just decided to send them to the planet they were supposed to go anyway well then Eka should have gone with him yeah, I know because yeah <laughs> he's one of them yeah. yeah but he's god conscious so I don't know if he could probably just fly there or... yeah but the thing is I think they were going for the continuation of the story in this new planet with other aliens and the, the Paxis would fight these aliens and mm. it, it's it's a cliffhanger that you know could go yeah. anywhere yeah and and it's actually kind of sad that the that hyperkind started out bad and it got kind of decent by you know by this comic but it's too late yeah this comic book started really decent but then at the end i think it falls apart in the third act of the story and yeah we don't really understand what they were going for here they should have they should have used this to close the story a little better instead of just leaving it open again. And then in the end they say, will this be the end of the Hyperkind? Check out the next Hyperkind special. Yeah, I'm still waiting for that one. Yeah. So yeah. That, that never that never happened. Oh, and in the meantime, send your letters and comments to Hyperkind or email to fburke at ccnet.com. Yeah. Now, we might try sending an email to Fred Burke, see if he's still around. Yeah. Say so, yeah. We, uh, when is Hyperkind Unleashed number two going to come out? Yeah, yeah. We should ask him. <laughs> hey, anybody out there wants to do that? It's yeah. Jeff Burke at ccnet.com. You know, tell him yeah. how much you like the Hyperkind and ask him if that's you know, when is the Unleashed number two going to come out? Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Don't don't send him. No, I I I would be interested in reading more Hyperkind now. I mean, but from number one and number two. Uh, if it weren't for this uh, this podcast, I would have stopped reading after number two because I'd really hated them at that point. Uh, but but by the end, uh, it started to get decent enough to make you want to keep reading them. Yeah, it's it's a shame that these comic books, some of them never really had a a, a, a proper direction for the yeah. story. They could they could have gone. I don't know if they ha had any idea that they were going to be only like nine issues. But, and this also ended with a Hokum and Hex short story, which I didn't read because I want to save it for when we're doing Hokum yeah, and Hex. Yeah, Ritual by Frank Lavis. Is he also the main writer for Hokum and Hex? I guess we'll find out. No, this was, I don't know, maybe. Frank Lavis. I'll call him Frank Lovelace. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the thing here is, I understand nowadays why some comic books like Boom Comics and other, you know, uh, Boom Studios and other comic books, they go for the whole miniseries story arcs. Because mm -hmm. at least they have a story with beginning and end. And they go yeah. and they number it from number one to number 12. Yeah, and right. And so, and, and so if there was a problem and, and it wasn't selling well, they would have said, okay, well, we, we you know, we had a plan for... Uh, for Hellraiser, the Dark Watch, to to be only twelve issues. Yeah, and yeah. and you know they they can wrap up the story because they're not trying to create this huge cliffhanger for the final issue. So yeah. I understand why that would happen. I mean, nowadays I've noticed it's a trend. Uh, I've started buying comic books again with the with the return of 
Hellraiser and Next Testament. And mm-hmm. I've noticed that you know a lot of comic book publishing companies are doing that. They're they're creating all these spin-offs from comic books. Mm-hmm. They're creating these miniseries arches, yeah. which are, are basically just the same comic book, the same characters, the same adventures, but they keep re- resetting the number to number one yeah. for a while. So, you know, interesting. Yeah, yeah, which was surprising when the Dark Watch came out that they did that because it really, I mean, it really did just take over from uh, from the Hellraiser comic that they were doing before, which also had story arcs within it, but they weren't resetting the numbers until the Dark Watch. Yeah. So that this was hyperkind. Um yeah. in in its conception, I think this had a lot of potential. It could have it could have been executed a lot better. I would like to see the treatment that Clyde Barker came up with for this. Yeah. If he ever did any sketches or anything. I have never seen anything like that. Mm-hmm. But Yeah, and, and and I think Amok's design kind of bugs me. And I don't know if that was Clive Barker or if it was somebody else, but you know him having those sword hands is yeah. not, it's not. I mean, it's really only functional for fighting, and it's not very realistic that somebody would look like that. Well, the whole thing is unrealistic. But the thing is, I think it's a product of the '90s. It's a product of the '90s. Mm-hmm. It's it's a yeah. '90s comic. It it has influences from all those X Men comic books that were coming yeah. out at the time. Rob Liefeld as an artist, uh, yeah. Jim Lee, they all had this this very specific s- style that influenced a lot of comic book artists uh, at, working for Marvel at the time, an image. So yeah. this comic book is a product of the 90s. I think Saint Sinner, in art-wise, was better. I think they were mm-hmm. going for a more adult uh, thing. Um, Steve Scross with... Ecto Kid was a very good artist. I mean, he was perfect. And I really hmm. enjoyed the writing in Ecto Kid, even though there were moments when it went a little flaky. But this one, I think, this one and Hokum and Hacks are the ones I like the least. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, and I remember I didn't like Hokum and Hex from the beginning because yeah. I only read the first issue of that one. And I do have some marked pages from Hyperkind. I do have them. Oh, yeah. Wow. I have original art pages from them, some splashes and some some nice pages. I need to take pictures of those whenever I can go back yeah. to Portugal and uh, actually oh, my collection okay. back into the United States. So you haven't you haven't scanned any of that? No, no, not yet. Okay, that would have been good for the for the header. For I know. This. Yeah, that's okay. But uh, but I do have some of these pages. They were cheap. They they were really cheap. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I you know give it a whirl if you want to if you want to read the Razor the Line comic books. Just yeah. be careful that they have these two crossovers. So, hope and I'm chances bad. are, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably a completist. So yeah, or you just don't want to spend money and you want to know what this was about. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and as you're reading them and you and you're reading all those corny lines and and stupid stuff and. And uh, just remember that it, it gets a little better. It gets better. Yeah. <laughs> In the last issue, it gets better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It because gets intriguing. It gets intriguing uh, just before it ends. No, I'm just being. I'm being. I'm being unfair. I'm being a little unjust and unfair. This, like I said, for the target audience, it was actually a fun superhero book. But I do believe that it was riddled with some problems in terms of. Finding a, a direction for the story and creating yeah. subplots that went nowhere. And, well, and, and I think you know, with us, the way we've been teasing it, uh, some of that is just directed at '90s comics in general. Because yes, uh, if you read the letters in these, it's all glowing and people love it, and and they act like it's a really mature storyline, and it doesn't it doesn't come off that way now. And that might just be that it's a product of its time. Yeah, I agree. This this is something that most 90s comics were guilty of. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Do yeah, have... like like Wolverine saying that same lines in every issue. I'm the best at what I do, but what I do isn't very nice. And Hulk smash. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to do a closing statement on Hyperkind? Well, I mean, gosh. I would give it like a 6 out of 10, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right for me as well. 6 out of 10. That that would be fair. 
Do we have any uh, uh, listener commentary or no. anybody? No? no. No, we tried, but nobody responded. Yeah, like I, I said, you know, like you said in the beginning, I think this comic book, they only had nine. Razorline comics probably were a bleep in the radar for a lot of Barker fans. Yeah. Besides, this yeah, was right, years and, and, ago. and 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 a lot of those people may not have even been comic book fans at all. Yeah, and and you know, many people out there probably are too young to remember this because this was twenty years ago. Yeah. Uh. I hate to th- I hate to think that, but I know, but it was 1993 was 20 years ago. Uh, so yeah, that's right. It's my that 93 was the year I graduated from high school. Yeah, me too. Well, what 93, 94. Oh, okay. I don't remember. I think in 94 I was already in college. So so Ecto Kid will be around like mid February that we'll talk about that one. Yeah, that sounds about right. So, you know, stay tuned and get the Razorline comic books if you if you want to have fun for like a, a couple of weekends. Yeah. And uh it's 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 Clyde Barker's foray into comic books apart from the uh Hellraiser and Nightbreed comic books. These yeah. were actually created from scratch, you know. Yeah, that's true. That's true. They're the only ones. Yeah, yeah. And 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 I kind of wonder if that was Clive Barker helping Steve Nile out, Steve Niles out, you Good know question. what I mean? Because Steve Niles had done so much for him with the uh, adaptations of of uh, the Books of Blood into yeah, comic books. Yeah, the Eclipse graphic novels, exactly. Yeah. Do you remember that comic book that had uh, those fear creatures that would get loose? Yeah, yeah. In a Renaissance uh, fair? Was that um, called Dread? No. Primal. It was Primal. It was Primal, yeah. Yeah. Primal. That was also created from scratch, I think, for comic books. Yeah. Yeah, it was. That was strange. Anyway, so that that was that was Hyperkind. So, you know, thanks yeah. for joining us for this episode and uh you know, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah, this is going this one's going to be a little long. Bandwidth for this episode was provided by Kip Jankowski. Uh, You can find us on the web at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave us a review on iTunes. We're on Podomatic, Xbox Music Store, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, Double Twitch, BlackBerry, and Pocket Cast. Uh, You can like our page on Facebook. Join the Occupy Midian group. We're on Twitter. We're at BarkerCast and at Occupy Midian. And the forum is www.clivebarkerfans.com slash forum. Uh, Theme was by Colin Lakativa.